Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining this evening. We are um, honored to have Debbie here to speak about her journey. Please, uh, I'll be sharing with you all our social media links so you can subscribe to keep uh, up to date about all our events. So the floor is yours, Debbie. Thanks a lot for being here this night. And can you hear me? I can hear you clearly. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to um, talk to you about Agile at Boeing and, and what we've been doing. And um, it's, it's a story. Um, and it's, it's mostly um, graphical. So I don't really have any details in the slides. I don't know that it would be worth sending them out. But um, I'll introduce myself to you, uh, and uh, and then we'll get into the story as I'm as I'm uh, starting to tell tell you about myself. So I am a, a software engineer by trade. I graduated from the University of Minnesota with a bachelor's of, of computer science, and um, I did have a software job while I was in college, so that was. Pretty cool. I was working for some um, small little companies doing, uh, you know, office type uh, software support, and uh, got a job offer directly out of uh, college to go work at Boeing. Um, and my first job was on the YF-22, uh, and this was my uh, actual first experience um, with waterfall. And so uh, I, I have been with Boeing ever since I got out of college and started that career. Um, and you'll, you'll find that I am uh, both an SPCT and a SAFE fellow, as well as an associate tech fellow um, within Boeing. So this first experience with Waterfall was pretty interesting. Um, I was working on the pilot vehicle interface for that uh, prototype airplane. And I was reading through the documentation for what was supposed to go on the displays. And I needed some more information to implement it. So I went to the author of the documentation and I, I explained to them what the problem was, why I needed more information. And they said, you know, um, here's what you need to do, but we've eliminated that in the next version of the software. Uh, so, you know, you'll have to build it for this version, but it's gone after this one. And I was very frustrated because I'm like, why am I building something that's not gonna be in the next version of the software? That doesn't make any sense to me. So the documentation that I had gotten that described the cockpit displays was, oh, maybe about a year behind um, when it was actually written. So not a very rapid uh, response. And uh, that was my very initial frustration with that whole process. Um, I continued working on the F-22 program for a while, and I actually got to work with the team that was designing that pilot, pilot vehicle interface, the ones that wrote the documentation before. And we decided we were gonna do things differently. So we had a team of um, two software engineers, a human factors person, and, um, four pilots, all from different types of aircraft. And what we did was we worked through the design of the displays and the uh, controls that the pilot would be using. And it was more of an experimental um, effort. So we would work on a specific aspect of the display. We had a simulator where we would implement what it was gonna look like. So the pilots, when they uh, came, they, they would be able to um, uh, sit in the cockpit and fly it. And our iterations on that were about six to nine months. So not truly agile in the sense of being agile, but it was more of an experimentation. We were able to do rapid changes while the customer was there, getting their feedback while they were sitting in the cockpit. Um, we could fly that solution. Um, while uh, if they came up with something else that we wanted to do. And it was uh, better than just having documentation. Um, so that was kind of my first, ex uh, first uh, 
experiment with Agile, even though it wasn't even called Agile back then. I'd say that was in the um, late 90s, mid to late 90s. In about 2006, I had my first encounter with Agile. And um, I had uh, been working on uh, some uh, research and development aspects of things. And one of the managers uh, that I was working with said, hey, um, have you heard about this thing called Agile Software Engineering? And I said, no. Um, and, and he said, oh, it's supposed to be uh, something about improving our software productivity. So uh, that just happened to be the, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. I went home over the Thanksgiving weekend. I, I read up, I, I found Scott Ambler's um, Agile modeling website and I read all about it and I read about Scrum. And I came back to my team the following Monday and I got them to agree uh, to try Agile. And that begins the tale of Agile at Boeing. Um, so if you know Boeing and Boeing uh, sees themselves as a manufacturing company, uh, they, we have a long history of lean as related to our factory. Uh, back in uh, the early 90s, we trained everyone in total quality management um, and the factory really embraced it. And then um, really in about 2007, we had this concept of lean plus. So lean wasn't good enough, we had to plus it. And uh, that was for us to move lean out of the factory and into the office environments. So there was a, a lot of marketing on that, a big rollout, um, you know, everybody was gonna be doing lean. We were gonna start saving all this money, um, but it didn't really meet the mark as it was still very um, production oriented and, and it was very hard to translate what they were talking about into um, what we did in an office environment. And especially when you talked about software and really there was no software factory at the time of, you know, one person did one thing, you rolled it, you rolled it, you rolled it. Um, so it wasn't really an integral way of working. And um, a lot of people saw this as a check the box. Okay, so I'm going to go implement a lean project. I'm going to show that I saved money and then I'm done. I don't have to do anything else anymore. Um, I don't know if anybody else has had uh, large initiatives that have rolled out like that and, and met with minimal success, but I would say that was one where it really just didn't hit what was necessary. I thought it was great because as I had been using Agile, I saw, yeah, this is great. This is what we need. We need to start changing our business processes. We need to lean things out. Um, but that just wasn't how it was uh, accepted within the company. So when we um, started doing Agile, it was about at the same time. Uh, I think um, I said that was 2006 when I first encountered Agile. And it was later that, or early in the following year, that I actually had a contract where I was able to um, start to really apply it because we had been given this really aggressive uh, contract and everybody said, oh, we have to do something different. So, okay, let's do something different. Let's bring Agile into this and let's have our, at least our software team use Agile. And so we planned it out, all out into the contract. Um, and, and we really started um, uh, working it very well on that contract. We had some great successes. Uh, and I would say uh, our first success was actually um, documented in 2009. And this was about the F-22 training system. And we were uh, basically re-architecting the training system and then upgrading it for uh, the pilots. And so we had a first time quality delivery. That was in about 2009. As we were using Agile on my program though, um, we started to realize, hey, if we're gonna do this really well at Boeing, we need to create a community of practice, start generating some support around it. And uh, I, I started to do that. And I found that there were all uh, sorts of other pockets across uh, Boeing Defense that were interested in doing this too. And so we, we got um, funding from the software engineering function 
and we um, had a big kickoff. We leveraged some materials from uh, Alan Shalloway from Net Objectives, which is where he was at the time. And we um, created our own content and we decided to call this the Boeing Agile Software Process. And it was very process oriented. There was not a whole lot of mindset values principles that went along with it. It was technical. It was about the teams. Um, it was not really about a cultural transformation. Um, we did a big rollout. We had posters, we had books, we had badge extenders. We did a website, we did training. We, yeah, big A, capital T, transformation, but not full stack transformation. So, um, so we were really uh, just doing scrum. That's all it was. It was focused at a team level. There was nothing in there about scaling. It really focused on software, not necessarily bringing in the test, um, which is a challenge, right? So um, I don't know if anybody else can relate to that issue, but uh, that's where we started. And uh, uh, sometimes even we, because of this Lean plus, plus initiative that was out there, which was being marketed very heavily uh, across the entire company, we had to do Stealth Agile underneath the construct of Lean Plus. And then we had to basically map our Agile into Lean Plus to show that they were doing one and the same thing so that we didn't have to do something different. Um, so we had a team, we, we actually created a, a team called the Lean Agile Support Services that was running out of the <clears throat> software engineering function that were driving the adoption, but not the transformation. Um, at the same time, we also had a parallel IT organization that was um, also doing Agile transformation using Scrum, but they developed a whole different process model. And so now we've got two areas within the company that are using Agile mostly as a process or a project management technique, all focused on software development, the end. Um, that's, that's really one of those stories that be, you know, yes, we had started with the teams. Yes, we started with software, but we didn't scale quick enough. We didn't um, take the opportunity to move it up and out of that area. But we were so successful. We um, run uh, in 2011, we uh, won a replication award. Um, in 2012, we had metrics that showed that we had de deployed to 60% of the um, BDS software organizations. Um, and we showed an increase in productivity, quality, throughput, and about $30 million of cost savings or cost avoidance over all of the uh, different uh, software organizations that we um, deployed this to. And in about 2013, they said, OK, so you have deployed it to 60% of the software teams. How are they doing? So we developed a maturity metric to see <laughs> how well they were doing. Um, and one of the things that uh, we never really ended up doing was to seeing how much of the organization had actually implemented Agile. Um, and so you'd get this, hey, we did 60%. Uh, I think we, at uh, one point in time, we got to 95% of the organizations, uh, the software teams, um, but we still didn't know, did that mean one Agile team? Did that mean the whole organization had gone? There was nothing that we were measuring to say how deep the Agile got, just how many teams we had moving using Agile. Uh, in 2013, we started, started trying to get, expand it to engineering. We said, Scrum, it's not just for software. You can use it for other engineering disciplines as well. Um, and, uh, and that was, an experiment and it, and it started going, we had some good support for it. Um, on, on my F-22 story, um, we continued, we expanded into systems engineering and test and we started looking at hardware and we did scaling. So our entire organization was using Agile. Um, we brought in the Scaled Agile framework. 
um, slowly over time it, as it was released in 2011. Um, and most of what I had done on F22, I had actually modeled after what I'd seen Dean Luffingwell working on um, when he was um, writing his, uh, well, he wrote his book called Scaling Software Agility, but before SAFE came, came out, he was actually blogging about what SAFE would be. And so we were kind of using some of those constructs along the way. We started changing our contracts. We started changing our processes. We started training our leaders. Um, we started making it a transformation versus an implementation and, um, and continued to have success on that. Um, so much so that we started uh, rolling it out beyond training systems into the rest of F22. So awesome, we have great successes. What happened next? Well, this is where you say the word, be careful what you measure <laughs> and the metrics can kill you. Um, so uh, as I was saying, we got to the point where um, we had penetrated more than 85% of the agile teams in BDS, uh, which is Boeing Defense. Um, we, our maturity metrics were on the rise. Um, and, and all of a sudden, funding for the core team and coaching, gone. And why? Because we made it, right? We had all these awards. We had 85% of the teams, our, our maturity metrics were on the rise. Programs continued to utilize Agile after that, but we started to backslide. So this was around 2014 to 2016. And it's unfortunate that, that this happened because we had a good amount of energy going. Um, and had we been able to convince the, the leaders that um, we weren't done, that you're never done, that you could, just can't stop with the coaching and the, and the guidance and the growth, um, the continuous learning journey, um, we, we would not have had this this gap in time where we really weren't advancing what we were doing. Um, IT had lost their uh, leadership earlier. And when we started new programs, they just went right back to the, the traditional way of working. They didn't even look at integrating um, Agile into their contracts. Now, I, I will say, and I'm not direction of SAFE itself. And, and they started including um, systems engineering and hardware development. And they, uh, the, the large solution layer was actually kind of created as a needed construct because of the complexity that um, we were describing to them as they were looking to develop that concepts, those concepts. So, um, since I was continuing to, to use it and I really didn't want to like lose the motivation and um, of Agile within the company, I went back to grassroots and I started a, um, an internal community of practice in 2015. And I think it probably took me about two months and I had 500 people already in the community of practice. So there was a lot of, of um, uh, energy for knowledge around Agile still, um, even though it wasn't being supported um, at the corporate level. And, and I'm going to say, um, you know, just one more thing about that, that, that age of Agile at Boeing, the early age of Agile at Boeing. We did not train our leaders. We trained teams. We considered it to be a technical practice. Um, and, and so I would say that was one of our, um, our failures is that we didn't start with the leaders. And that is something that we are adjusting as we go forward. Um, so uh, here I'm talking about the Boeing Centennial and actually Boeing turned 105 last week. So 
Um, it's been five years since this happened. Um, so we had big celebrations for being 100 years old and we started uh, to look at the future and recognize that there's something that we needed to do in order to make it for a, another 100 years. Um, and so that brought in the digital transformation and looking at Industry 4.0. Uh, there was a, um, a, a digital transformation was kicked off. IT was um, had been uh, kind of heading in this direction for um, many years, um, but the the naming of it in terms of a recognition that this was a digital transformation uh, came here. Uh, this was a company wide effort led by our um, IT CIO Ted Colbert at the time. environment. We created labs in um, three to four locations globally, um, set them all up very nicely. There was a great culture in there. We had pairing stations. It was all open. Um, it was a sense of community. In some places, they even served breakfast and had everybody do lunch together. Of course, we had ping pong tables because who doesn't do ping pong tables when you write software and do agile? Um, and so we, we would bring teams into the lab, uh, give them the new tools, and then send them home to their old tools, to their old culture, and expect them to be transformed. <laughs> so um, now some people were so excited about the lab, they stayed there and they never wanted to leave the lab. And those, those programs actually continued to grow and, and learn and start to deliver things. So, um, you know, we have the big monitors up that showed the build statuses and everything. And, um, and, and I think it was a, a good success of um, modernizing the technology and creating a culture. It just didn't translate outside of the lab. And, uh, you know, so you can incubate something, but the transformation needs to come outside um, when you go back. So um, eh, we, it went well for about three or four years and then it, it lost its funding as well. So in another building just down the street, um, we had the, this digital transformation, which we then called second, si second Century Enterprise Systems, decided to go safe. And uh, I remember I was at the uh, SAFE Summit in 2017, and I got a call during the last session, and uh, it was from the chief architect of this uh, Second Century Enterprise Systems, and he said, Debbie, we need your help. Um, we're going to go all safe. And this organization right now, it's about 2,000 people. And I said, that is awesome. I'm excited. Transformation for um, was about 700. And it was not just me. It was um, me and uh, several folks from uh, Lockheed and the government that were designing it together. So here I was coming in as the lead for a transformation um, and I had to design the whole thing myself and uh, get people um, coaches in to staff it for the for the transformation um, so it was all of our infrastructure it included um, architecture uh, enterprise architecture business architecture our um, uh, the resource planning tools, the product lifecycle management tools, our manufacturing infrastructure, um, and then the program office that was running it. Um, so I, I did do a presentation on this in the 2019 SAFE Summit. Um, and at that time, uh, we had scaled up to 18 Agile release trains. And um, of those 18 Agile release trains, there were really three or four solution trains within it. And so we burst the boundaries of SAFE and we actually created what we called a super solution train, which was the thing that bound them all together and integrated across the agile release trains. 
Um, and, and part of that was that this was all a business process transformation. Um, and they were already talking about agile practices, but they didn't have any scaling. So, you know, I saw um, program leaders doing a daily standup with about um, maybe 50 people on the phone updating a OneNote for their status from the previous day. And I just kind of shook my head and said, okay, this is great, but this is not to scale. Let's, let's look at what we need to do um, to make this to scale so that you're not using team level practices at the, at the program leader level. Um, I actually, because it was a business uh, process transformation, when they requested my support, I said, I'm going to create you a Lean Agile Center of Excellence, and I am going to model, uh, create a model that we can then elevate up to the enterprise. Because if we are truly transforming the way we work at Boeing, then we are going to need enterprise level support for Agile and scaled agile that we don't have today. And I told them the story I'm telling you about how we had um, you know, fallen behind because we had not continued to support it in the way that it needed to be supported. Um, so I did get some, some, uh, some leverage on that and um, I did lead that effort and um, and uh, working towards creating that uh, Agile Center of Excellence. So large transformation that I was working on, um, great effort. While I was doing that, I got a shoulder tap at, from uh, Boeing Commercial. And there were a bunch of leaders there who had decided that they wanted to use an Agile way of working to build our next commercial airplane. Um, <clears throat> So that was to me really exciting. So I'm sitting over here going, yes, I have this really great large scale agile transformation, doing all this infrastructure really important. Over here I have uh, an innovative way of building an airplane using agile, no software development. And I was like, which one should I do? <laughs> um, so I kind of create self supported both, which was kind of crazy. Um, I tend to take on more work than I, than I can afford to do. Um, but they started using SAFE and we, we got them started in the right way. We got the leaders trained. All, I had all the leaders uh, go to an immersive uh, two-day agile training um, with Joe Justice at Wikispeed. And so they, they learned how agile could be applied to hardware while they were learning about agile. Um, and it was really exciting to see the leadership kind of um, take the lead on it and, and then um, be very supportive of it. And they started, um, I think the first, what they called PI planning, which I would not call PI planning that I attended, there were uh, 50 agile teams not connected in any way, just, just a random 50 agile teams trying to do their planning and, and come to some kind of alignment. Um, the, Two um, program increment plannings later, we had scoped out 33 agile release trains, which included uh, probably, um, let's say about a dozen of what they would call the super solution trains. And then we also had some enabler trains that we had that were really just enabling uh, the, the implementation and the design of the aircraft. Um, it was challenging to change the mindset, but, um, but it was a great experiment. And it was one of the first um, large scale planning where I actually saw the leadership team um, listen to the teams and change the, the schedule, change the master schedule overnight during PI planning because of what they heard the teams say they could or could not do. Um, and so it was, it was a great experiment. It had lots of um, executive committee visibility, which meant that Agile started to be talked about at the executive level. 
um, which if, if you know about agile transformations, that's kind of the key, right? You've got to get it up at the top all the way down to where the teams are going in order to make it sustainable and, and to be able to keep it going. So it was, it was a, little, um, a, a little enlightening there. Um, it was, it was a, a good way to get started there. And um, of course, uh, when COVID came along, uh, that program was canceled because nobody needs a new airplane when nobody's flying. <laughs> so unfortunately, all the momentum that they had, all the, um, the information uh, that they had learned about agile ways of working and how to apply that to building an airplane um, really um, might have gotten a little lost. Um, but, I, but I thought it was it was a, a really good um, pivot point for us within the company and for Boeing Commercial to, uh, that was really their first um, foray into uh, using Agile. We did have, I think, what may have been the largest um, co-located PI planning event um, where we had uh, 1,200 people all together in a conference uh, hotel. And we have a, a really cool picture of it too. So, but I can't, I couldn't put that in this presentation. <laughs> so, um, I was finally getting enough coaches to support um, the Second Century Enterprise effort um, and gaining advocacy for creating a center of excellence. So, for those 2,000 people, now I'm back in the um, Second Century Enterprise Systems. For the 2,000 people, I created a Lean Agile Center of Excellence with about 28 coaches. Um, to me, that was not even enough because of the um, massive change in mindset, uh, the effects that it might have on our business architecture, the effects that it would have on our operating model and how we, um, we move uh, with the cadence of that. Um, but it was, it was a good start and, um, and I had great support for it. So I appreciated that. And then um, finally, I got enough advocacy to create that Enterprise Agile Center of Excellence, um, which is where I live today. And um, we held a design workshop in order to create that. So I brought in all of the larger Agile centers um, I brought in folks from this airplane program. I bought in, brought in folks from Second Century. I brought in some folks from F22 and from our training systems group and from some of our other digital um, uh, development areas that were uh, still using Agile. Um, and, and we scoped out what we thought the center of excellence would be. Um, and the VP that I was working with at the time said, are we thinking big enough? Um, so I got really excited. It's like, oh, maybe this could be. But what I didn't want this to be was a Lean Plus initiative. So I didn't want this to be a push. What I wanted it to be was a pull. So that if you're excited about a different way of working, if you want to improve your productivity, if you're curious about what Agile could do for you, then we invite you to come learn more, but this, I never wanted this to be a mandate and a push across the entire company. And, um, and it hasn't become that yet. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, because the seven, the, you may have heard a small issue that Boeing had with the 737 MAX and having it grounded. And on top of that, COVID came in. Um, the VP that I was working with at the time, um, was assigned to that effort 100%. And so we just went back, we have this bias for continuing to move forward, even though, even if we don't have the advocacy. And so we continued to connect the global network. Um, I became a, um, an internal safe program consultant trainer at the time, and I was able to start teaching, implementing safe internally. So growing my internal, um, SPCs and coaches. Uh, just last year, we developed a, a coaching academy program, which is a, um, a mentor-mentee um, relationship uh, 
between some of the more senior and uh, junior coaches within the company and a series of workshops that we had to get them to understand what a coaching competency is and what all the factors of that competency are and uh, making sure that I didn't have to go continue to go um, bring in consultants uh, to continue our agile journey because of the um, what I did on Second Century, um, we started and a lot of that was consultants coming in and it took a long time for us to get enough funding to bring Boeing coaches in um, to support that. And, um, and it didn't quite work how I wanted it to. So uh, once we created that center of excellence, we decided that no, we need to grow our internal competency with that. Um, so, it was, it was good, we got started, but um, not the right time. It was a tough time for us to kind of be a startup within the company. And, uh, and in the long run, that organization that I was in actually disbanded and we were told to go find a business unit to be a part of. And so we did, and we moved into Boeing Global Services and we started over again. And uh, not completely started over again because we had our network set up. We had um, the coaching network going. We were teaching uh, classes. We taught over 2,000 students, probably about 2,500 students every year uh, for Agile. And, um, and then we just kind of kept that going. And the great thing is that Boeing Global Services, the CEO is now Ted Colbert, who was the CIO with the digital transformation environment. So he gets Agile, he supports it, and he wants to run BGS using Agile principles. And so we have a great opportunity here to take an entire business unit and, and um, grow the competency within there and start to get it to be Agile as an operating model, as a standard way of working. Not to say that everybody has to be Agile, but to say that, um, everybody needs to understand Agile in order to support those parts of the, of the company that are continuing to use Agile. And this gets into um, understanding uh, how finance might need to change, how HR might need to change, um, how we need to look at our organizations differently, how we need to look at performance management differently. Um, and we're just, all that's on my backlog and we're really starting to kind of uh, click away at it um, and get up to the support. So we still have a lot of uh, disconnected initiatives across the company uh, in this area, but we're trying to get them aligned and connected together. Boeing's a big company. It's kind of hard to, <laughs> to get that alignment, um, but we're, st we're still there and, and driving it. And we are going in with this um, leader first uh, uh, concept so that we want to make sure that we're getting advocacy from the leaders of the organizations and that they recognize what their role in the transformation is when going to Agile. We are bringing it in as a transformation, not as a practice. So we're uh, going back to the, the Agile mindset values and principles and making sure that everybody understands what that is. We have translated the um, Agile manifesto into terms that make sense outside of the software world. And, and that was based on our experience on the Boeing commercial um, program where when we were training them with materials that had a lot of software in it, and they were just, they were completely put off. They were like this agile thing, it's just for software who needs it. So now we've got it um, defined more in a way that uh, anyone can take advantage of. And we've got, um, I gave a list the other day, we've got people in supply chain that are using agile um, ways of working. We've got folks in, um, well, my uh, program management core group is using agile, um, several business process development. Um, tech pubs writers are using it. And we're just really starting to see it expand outside of uh, software. We even have our factory support centers using agile ways of working um, to kind of diagnose some of the problems in the factory and, and do some root cause analysis and come up with solutions. So we're really seeing the growth 
and the value of Agile and um, really kind of getting to that point where I thought we would have been maybe about uh, eight years ago, but, um, but it's, it's, it's good to see it getting there. And that I think that um, had we not had that, that uh, the dark ages, that we probably wouldn't co have come out of that as knowledgeable about what we did wrong and what we needed to do differently in the future. Um, and that's my presentation for the day. So it looks like we have time for some Q&A. Oh, sorry. I, I'm curious how you guys did the training of the leadership, because I think that's like an overlooked piece of it. So how did you get buy-in for that? And, and what approach did you guys take? We're still working on that. <laughs> um, so we, in, in a lot of areas, we did get, um, I'm just going to stop sharing here. In a lot of areas, we did get the leaders to come in and um, actually take the training and um, uh, you know, spend the spend the two days uh, in the class, um, but they, they it was spotty, right? Um, so now what we're doing is we're basically saying, hey, we have this basic agile training that we need you to take because it depends on where you are in the organization as to um, what kind of information you need. Like I don't need my my the leaders of the organization to understand all the aspects of Scrum. Um, so I want them to understand what the value is that we intend to get out of Agile, and then what behaviors do they have that need to change. And so uh, from that perspective, we're, we're looking at more creating more of a leadership development program that kind of talks to the behaviors versus getting them to understand um, Agile down and in. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ken, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, Debbie, I was going to ask, so Scaled Agile Framework, um, some people, I guess, are not as much in favor of it as others, including some of those in our customer base. What do you, what do you say to people who say that the Scaled Agile Framework is just too big, too unwieldy, isn't Agile enough? <laughs> I say you should see what my organization looks like now and understand that safe is better than that. Um, so it's a stepping stone. And uh, there's a comment here by uh, Jean in the, in the chat too. Um, I see it as, um, sometimes I've said it's my gateway drug into um, Agile. <laughs> so when you are so complex and, and you have all of the rigidness of the organization around you, um, you need to have a way to step into it if people aren't ready for a complete transformation. So, um, so I bring that in. And then the idea is that I want to look for ways that I can deconstruct that. And that was the biggest thing that I didn't do on Second Century was I wasn't able to, to get them to do value stream mapping and look for ways that they could remove dependencies so they didn't have to have that super solution train. Um, I think that safe is good when you use it in the right way. And there is no buy the book safe, um, which I tell people. So when we come in and we coach people to use safe, um, we're looking for where do the safe constructs make sense for us to use and where do we not need the complexity of safe so that that's, that's what we're bringing in. And, and when I teach um, the safe program consultants, that's, that's what I tell them. I said, as a coach at Boeing, you need to understand safe so that you can understand where it makes sense to use it, but also where it doesn't make sense to use it. Uh, Ted. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Debbie. Uh, quick question. Um, part of the problem that I've seen, and you know, and I'm, I'm from the banking industry, but I think it may be relevant. One of the things that I've seen, one of these stumbling blocks, is the project management office. They are so steeped in their traditional PMO practices. Now I know safe, you know, 5.0 it introduces the concept of an agile PMO. So I'm just wondering, I don't know, you know, how you guys handle, you know, 
project managers or are they already, you know, agile um, project management? You know, how do you, how do you guys handle that? Um, well, the center of excellence actually lives in the program management office. And that was how we decided to handle it. So we said that um, what we need to do is transform our program management office to become more agile. And then because they need to know what agile is like in order to use it on programs. And then in the long run, we need to know when do we need a program construct and when could we just use the value stream product-based construct? I think as long as we're in a, a contracting world with our government programs, um, we'll still likely need to have that program construct. But with a lot of our internal value streams, we're really looking at making them long-lived value streams aligned to our operational value streams and then funding those those value streams. Mm -hmm. We're still a very project-based right now, but at least I think we've got the center of excellence in the right place so that mm -hmm. we can start to um, influence out. Great. That was a really great question. Great, thank you. Um, and I do see, Marco, your question about uh, pre-existing team culture. Um, we've got it all the time. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of, uh, um, sometimes they didn't have a good experience. And so we just kind of like to go in and do a restart, get them back to basics, get them to understand the mindset and why are we actually why are we actually doing Agile? What, do, what are the benefits that we hope to achieve? What are the outcomes that we hope to achieve? And then slowly start to um, work on that uh, it, from a cultural perspective. But it's not just the teams, it's the whole organization. And if the leaders don't get on board with that, then the teams aren't going to feel the you know, embrace the the um, self organization and the self determination that's needed to really um, make agile take off. Thanks, David. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm gonna not say this right, Sara Mathy. <laughs> yeah, Debbie, that's okay. <laughs> so um, we uh, experience or we see that agile alone doesn't, uh, you know. Uh, provide the agile ways of working alone doesn't provide the required value for the organization but mm -hmm. when it joins hands with customer centric design thinking principles and devops it it helps us to uh, you know holistically uh, produce that value for our customers as well as the organization so mm -hmm. in that perspective how did you uh, i mean what what was the approach that you took um that, that is very much what we're bringing in now. So in the early days, we did bring in continuous integration, continuous um, delivery, I think, CICD. And, um, and, and that was a good start, but it didn't carry forward. And so now we're kind of saying Agile is uh, one way of working. And it, there are some very compatible practices that go along with it, such as the ones that you mentioned. Um, and we also talk about um, lean, theory of constraints, critical chain program management, because not everything that we do is software. Um, and so sometimes we need uh, a little bit more constraint around things. So we're basically calling this our next gen program management approach which is not really program management, but it also brings in engineering and they're paired together. And so what are those newer lean, agile techniques and practices that we can bring in? Um, we bring in design thinking, we bring in model-based engineering, we bring in set-based engineering, um, just all of those compatible practices. And so when we talk about the Agile mindset and we do that basic training, we bring up a slide that says, here are some of the compatible practices that go along with Agile. Um, and that's why our transformation uh, now is not just an Agile transformation, it's a way of working transformation. So we're really looking at what's the right way of working based on your context, based on your complexity, based on your product. Uh, Natasha. 
Hi, um, I just wanted to ask my corporation, a lot of our contracts are still done like in a very waterfall uh, systems engineering like method. So I, I'm kind of curious how you've seen teams lean into doing agile in their like day to day practices when contracts and customers are kind of expecting a waterfall approach. Um, yeah, that's one of the big things that we're um, trying to address right now, because um, we've had some organizations that have been using Agile for more than four years, and they haven't addressed that customer relationship as well as the, the contracting piece of it. Um, we have some uh, contracts that we've developed that are more Agile from contracting people to work for us, kind of in a shared services approach. And we've had a couple of really um, interesting contracts from the government um, that have been uh, more aligned with uh, with an agile way of working. I had one where I basically said, um, you are buying 60 story points worth of work and you can prioritize what those 60 story points of work are throughout the course of the, um, the contract. And then if you want more than 60 story points worth of work, you can add on to it. And so um, I think that there's there's a lot of new ideas about contracting out there. And you just, this is part of business agility. You've got to get your contracting folks, your supplier management folks trained up and on board so that they understand what things they're putting in those contracts that are constraining you and slowing you down. Um, John. Yeah, question. I'm curious if you know um, the ratio of the size of your LACE organization as compared to the size of the members in the Agile projects that those LACE members are uh, helping. Um, I can tell you it's not big enough. <laughs> so I have five people in my um, in the center of excellence at the enterprise level. Um, and, and we also support uh, that one business unit. We are not actively coaching programs. Um, so the, we're, what we're trying to do right now is develop this uh, definition of a coaching model to understand that your scrum masters, your release train engineers, your solution train engineers, and your lean agile leaders can all be coaches within your organization to support your transformation but it depends on whether or not they're actually doing that. Are they a full-time release train engineer with like 10 teams, agile teams that are supporting? They probably don't have time to do a whole lot of coaching. Um, and so we will likely recommend that we have one coach in those larger, more complex organizations, whereas in the smaller ones, the RTE might be able to um, be that coach with support from the Scrum Masters. And then we are really, really, really trying to bring our Agile leaders and program leaders and managers up to speed on becoming Lean Agile leaders and coaches themselves, um, rather than uh, having them being assigning work to people. Um, but that's, it's going to take us a while. There's definitely um, still a lot of learning to do. Uh, and um, and, and it's great that we have support from Ted Colbert because every time that um, we have a, a, a program out there and, and we're talking about the problems that we're having because of Agile, he says, well, have the program managers been trained? Do they know Agile? <laughs> and so it's, it's really great to have that kind of advocacy from the, from the uh, CEO to help us. Um, I know there's a, 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 Brian has a question about um, in the chat about where do you see Agile long-term strategies and philosophies. Um, honestly, I would hope someday we're not using the word agile. Um, <laughs> I, I would hope that we're really looking at enabling flow in our organizations, um, decentralizing decision-making and, uh, and just having that more organic organization. Um, I know when we build big things, that's, that's gonna be a challenge and a reality. But, um, but I'd really like to, like to see us just make this, ingrain this into our culture um, and uh, 
understand that there will still be some things that need to work in a more uh, traditional way. And I think, you know, when you look at what PMI has been doing over the past couple of years, they're, they're really kind of shifting uh, a lot of their training materials as well from the more traditional project management to what they call agile project management, which is a good step, um, but we still have to kind of get the culture piece in there as well. Um, Saramati? Yeah, I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, so when we organize our people and our teams around uh, value streams and arts, uh, the biggest challenge there for them to be operating in that way is going to be budgeting and funding. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know your, uh, you know, approach towards implementing the lean portfolio management concepts and principles within the organization and how did that, um, you know, take the first step? Yeah, and that was something that I, that I um, uh, attempted to do on Second Century Enterprise Systems. They already had a, a portfolio concept there and a construct that they were using. And the idea was to take lean portfolio management and start shaping the way that was uh, working. Um, I'm, I'm still not sure that's happened. Um, they claim they're, they're kind of uh, working along value streams now. Um, it's not what I'm hearing from <laughs> the grassroots, so we'll see uh, how that looks. Now, I do know that we have um, at least one other organization that has holistically implemented the Lean Portfolio Management, and they seem to be uh, having some good successes with it. And then within Boeing Global Services, uh, I have at least one place where I plan on piloting that this year and bringing in our finance organization so that we can start to shift that financial model and see how that looks as well. So we're really, really attempting to do that. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. And John, did you have another question or still didn't lower your hand from before? I did not, I'll okay. clear that, thank you. Um, so I think I've answered all the questions in the chat and uh, doesn't seem to be any more hands raised. So we're about at time. Thank you, Debbie, that was great. Uh, thanks for all uh, what you presented to us and thanks everyone for attending. I'll be sharing the recording. The recording is already live on YouTube and I'll be sharing that with everyone. Uh, apologies for who didn't have the chance to attend as the limit of um, my Zoom license was over. So <laughs> thanks a lot and see you next month. Thanks a lot, Debbie. Thanks, Enjoy. Mark. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for organizing this.